Shalom Chavrim. It is good for you guys that, uh, that you're able to be here with us tonight. And uh, I have a very special guest, Brother Gary Skagibo. Brother Gary's been on with us here before. And uh, tonight, the message that you're going to be watching, I'll break this up into two parts. Uh, it, is, it is a lengthy service, but it is vital that you take the time and, uh, and, and go through this information. Brother Gary has compiled the information on the, the historical side of, of how the New World System, the New World Order, the New World Religious System, Economic System, and Political System, where they were birthed, how they've come up, uh, down through the history, all the way back to Babylon up until now in the modern time that we're living in. Uh, so I really encourage you, you don't have to worry about me screaming and shouting because Brother Gary keeps me more on an even kill in this particular program. So uh, it's very educational, it's insightful, it's important that you hear it uh, because you'll see the pieces of the puzzle fit together and then you will know who's behind it all. So stay tuned, God bless you, and I hope you enjoy it. Shalom. We're looking at the one world political system, the one world religious system that's already well underway. And of course, we see that the one world economic system plays into both of those. And so our discussion will concentrate on an awareness for those that are, are seekers of to stay in the Word of God so that they may uh, be granted wisdom onto the things that they are going to see transpire and continue to unfold as we approach the end of the age. In 2011, in July of 2011, I was in Washington, D.C., Brother Steve, and I had the blessing to meet with uh, a good friend of mine who at that time was serving as the Assistant Chief Chaplain of the United States Senate in Washington, D.C., a very uh, spirit-filled ind individual, <clears throat> and he had told me of a dream that he'd had and I wanted to share with our viewing audience just to set a general stage. Amen. Amen. He said that in his vision, in his dream, he saw a picture of a cross. And what came to him was the vertical beam of the cross represented God's word coming down vertically to those that are seeking his word. The horizontal beam of the cross represented the various denominations, churches, synagogues, from which individuals from these denominations that were truly seeking the Word of God would be drawn vertically and they would receive the truth and the knowledge and the Word of God because they had a hunger for it in their heart and they responded to the things of God. So as we get into some of the subject matter that we're going to talk about, it may be very easy for someone to feel if they're in a particular denomination or religion, and I use that word cautiously, that perhaps there's an agenda against that particular denomination or religion. And so I would ask everyone just to keep in mind that picture that we, we talked about, about seeking the things of God first. And we'll examine uh, things that are factual, things that have already, statements that have been made, events that have transpired, and we won't make any specific conclusions other than what they are. And then we'll go back, and, and perhaps it's obviously going to take an episode or two more to address some of the specifics and maybe some of the questions that people have. So if we go back to uh, Daniel and, of course, the book of Revelation, Amen. we know... <clears throat> from the dream of King Nebuchadnezzar, that that final world empire would be forming, and it's forming now. And I, I know most of your viewers are well in tune with that. And so, Steve, just to, uh, to ask you, so we're on the same uh, sheet of music, that final world empire was going to be what? Do you, do you remember what it would be? The Babylonian Empire. <laughs> no. Okay, no, go ahead. You, you go ahead and enlighten me on this. Uh, no, I'm, well, I'm sure you're, you're well in tune on that. I didn't mean to put you on the spot on that. No. Uh, actually, <clears throat> we actually see all the, the empires that Daniel mentions. 
they will be a part of the final empire. But just to go back and review, remember that uh, King Nebuchadnezzar had a dream, and Daniel, of course, was in the king's service and was the only one that could interpret the dream. Remember that had the feet uh, of Daniel, brass and the feet of mixed with iron and clay. That's it. That's the empire that's right. forming now. Exactly. So, of course, the first one, one represented uh, the head of gold was the Babylonian Empire. Right. And then the chest and arms of silver, the Medo-Persian Empire. The abdomen of gold was, of course, Greece. And then the two legs of iron represented Rome. And the two legs represented the two capital cities of Rome and Constantinople. And then there was a period of time when we get to that final empire of the feet. And as you pointed out, made up of a combination of clay and iron, so not a truly centralized government like, like we have here in the United States, but a confederation of power, yes. but yet centralized. And it would be not only a political entity, but it would be a religious entity, and of course a one world economic system. Exactly. And so that's where we are today. So between the fall of the Roman Empire and, and today, some people might ask, well, when did this final political system begin to, to evolve? And some would also say that Rome never really was defeated. It just collapsed in on itself and sat in disarray for years. <clears throat> Let's go back now to December 25th of 800 A.D. Pope Leo crowned Charlemagne and proclaimed him as emperor of his Holy Roman Empire. So now we see that there's a political leader in Charlemagne and we see that Pope Leo continues to exercise his power as the religious leader and we see then that church and state, iron and clay, in 800 AD with the revival of the declared Holy Roman Empire. And this rule would take place, Brother Steve, for approximately a little over a thousand years. So from 800 AD to 1806 AD, the Holy Roman Empire uh, was in play. But then in 1806, by the time we get to 1806, we began to see what some people would say the death of the Holy Roman Empire. It appeared to be dead. However, on November 9th, excuse me, November 3rd of 2009, some would say that the Holy Roman Empire was reborn. So from appearing to be dead, it now is reborn, again on November 3rd, 2009. And our reference, reference for that is Daniel chapter 2, 44, Revelation 17, 12 through 14. So we're going to concentrate on post-World War II and pick up on some of the things that have been transpiring to bring about where we are today concerning the strength of the one world political system and the one world religious system. Again, these are, are snapshots and they're, they're post-World War I. We're also going to see the realization that the political system now realizes that in order to advance their agenda fully, they have to form an alliance with the religious system. That's exactly what we see them trying to do now. And that's what we're seeing them trying to do now. In fact, on a grander scale, as time keeps moving on, and, and, and we're, as we were discussing privately before coming on, on air now, we, we are seeing um, an escalation of a, a one-world system uh, and, and what's kind of ironic, Brother Gary, the religious side of it, they're bringing up first. Uh, 
and I would have actually thought it would have been the financial side, then the religious side. That was just kind of like in my thought, but um, we're seeing it just the opposite. They're setting in motion the religious aspects, and then I guess then the financial aspects would follow suit. The, there's several key things that I'm excited. I'm going to be excited to talk about. Uh, from relative recent history where the political side has gone through a learning curve and they realize that the very, by having a, the religious system in alliance with them, the religious system speaks directly to the people and is, and is highly successful in motivating uh, the individual people to sign on to the political system's agenda. And we're going to talk about Poland here as we get through our interview on how that was the test case. We're going to talk about uh, Gorbachev, his book, Perestroika, where he realizes that because he acted in concert with uh, religious leaders and Poland was a test case that could be taken and applied to uh, the communist socialism model. And uh, very interesting. So let's go back then to, uh, so the concept then is that the, the one world political system is going to engage the religious system to advance its goals. Now, in order to do that, they're going to have to break down all the barriers that one traditionally might find in all the denominations. Today we have, what, over 265 Christian denominations alone? Somewhere in there. Main, mainstream, anyway. Mainstream. Yes. Get into the thousands when we get into all the little uh, isms off of that, yes. Now the reason I'm not jumping into the cases right away is because I want to set the stage. Now the way they do that is they need to eliminate anything that might be considered exclusive. Because in order to, to do what they need to do, everybody has to be inclusive. We all have to agree on a smaller set of core issues, even if it means discarding our basic biblical truths and doctrines. And they know that, and there's been a process that's been ongoing to do just that. And that is the subtle flaw in terms like ecumenicalism in which the Christian denominations have, there have been attempts to work together. Nothing wrong with working together, but again, the fatal flaw has been to discount uh, true biblical doctrine in favor of compromise. And they've all, there are already things that the United Nations has uh, passed that even the United States now has a signatory on. Uh, and one of those uh, things is, is the Treaty on Genocide. And we'll get into that a little bit more, but the long and the short of it is, by getting everyone to agree to a common set of core issues at the expense of their biblical doctrine, now they can eliminate uh, any objections. And they can go forth as a, as a religious force that will support the political agendas, uh, goals, and objectives for one world government. And so that is the process that they, they are implementing right now, just to kind of set the stage on where we are. Exactly. So from there going, going forward, we can now begin to examine. We're going to start out and we're going to look at, and I want to make this statement now before we get into it again, so no one misunderstands. Ultimately, and the reason we're making these videos, it's a warning for those that truly seek the things of God to stay in the Word of God and in prayer and remember the faith and the promises Amen. of our God and our Lord. However, the leadership for some of these things getting started uh, a large part of it has come through the Vatican. Post-World War II, we're going to start talking about that. Ultimately, it will be Catholicism and 
the Protestant denominations, I'm talking about the mainstream, where a large number of people uh, will be deceived. And they will be influenced by the false prophet that will come through this apostate one world religion and they will be influenced to follow the Antichrist. And again, in the Christian mainstream, it's not just Catholicism, but it will be uh, mainstream Christian denominations. And that's why that example I gave at the beginning when we started talking about uh, the dream that my associate had. What's really important is that individuals that seek out the Word of God uh, continue to do that and not associate themselves with a don denomination per se, but associate themselves with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob yes. and the Word of God. And if we stay anchored there, then in prayer we'll avoid these pitfalls that are awaiting. So let's start out then. Post uh, World War II, and we're going to talk about six to seven leadership uh, goals of the different popes. And we're going to start out with the pope that was in the Vatican at the time of World War II. Pope Pius the Twelfth. Pope Pius the Twelfth. What a scoundrel! During World War II, he favored formation of the United Nations as a legacy to World Federation. Now, that simply means world government, centralized government, by one, the affirmation of the necessity of a, a, a supranational world order, accepting the United Nations, but with ceaseless efforts to strengthen it, and to promote the fullest cooperation with every agency that promotes international friendship. As an internationalist, his goal was to overcome every vestige of nationalistic narrowism. Now, what do you think that means, Brother Steve? What, what is a vestige of narrowistic nationalism? You know, Brother Gary, when you get in dumb advance, <laughs> that one goes over my head. What that oh, simply God. means is, and he's not alone, he's just the first one that's saying it in our example. Right. They want to do away with sovereign borders of the individual nations. That is interesting. And, and this is in a papal decree. So that means the elimination of national sovereignty of the individual nations. Pius desired and sought and prayed for a future world political organization true to the spirit of federalism. And Pius is quoted as saying, quote, Catholics above all must realize that they are called to overcome every vestige of nationalistic narrowness. Pius was calling on Catholics to disregard national sovereignty in favor of world government. Pope Pius goes on, went on to say, quote, Catholics have the obligation of insisting on the ratification of the Genocide Pact. Now, what is the Genocide Pact? Well, just by listening to the name Genocide Pact, it's a treaty. Of course, everyone would be against genocide. Who in the world would not want to be against genocide? But the way they define it, in the definition, the treaty outlaws both physical and mental harm to a minority. Mental harm. Who decides what mental harm is? So by speaking or writing against a particular behavior, for example, today one of the issues is to be in favor of marriage between a man and a woman as opposed to marriage between a man and a man or a woman and a woman, that would be considered mental genocide because someone could interpret that you are um, hurting someone's feelings because you object or they might claim that they have a right 
a man and a man and a woman and a woman to be married. Now, this is already in effect. And we'll get to, it was actually signed by President Ronald Reagan and ratified by our United States Senate shortly after he signed it. Uh, and it now makes it a crime to commit uh, mental harm to someone because it can be interpreted as genocide. And under the treaty of uh, the United Nations, uh, there are penalties. And since the U.S. is a signatory to that treaty, the treaty trumps the U.S. Constitution and U.S. law. For example, in Canada, there was a minister that spoke out from the pulpit on the issue of uh, gay and lesbian marriage and the things associated with it, and he was sentenced to five years incarceration. Now, in the United States, there is a stipulation for those members of the clergy. They're allowed to say something from the pulpit regarding that issue. But if you're not, quote unquote, officially recognized or licensed, and you say something like that, technically you could be deemed here in the United States in violation of the Treaty of Genocide and there, there would be uh, ramifications to that, legal ramifications. That already exists. We'll get more into that later. Not later. Brother Gary, before we go any further though, um, one thing, two, two things I'd like to just mention in, in light of the things you've said. And I'm sure we'll, you'll go back and cover some of this, but with Pope Pius XII, first off, talking about, uh, and I forget the technical term for that, but essentially that we should be a, 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 a society no borders. And he's only the first one, that first pope that brings that up. There are others you'll see in succession. Right. And, what, and what's interesting about that, though, is that uh, that's exactly what Hitler was trying to achieve. So it just kind of makes you wonder, was Hitler their, uh, their, their general for their purpose uh, and trying to, uh, to establish a purpose, if we can actually link it we know, that we, we know that Pope Pius XII was linked to Hitler to begin with. And as Hitler stated in one of his own uh, uh, comments, he said, I'm only carrying out what the Catholic Church had already started, and that was to annihilate the Jews, the Christ killers, as he put it, and as it, the Church has put it as well. The other thing, though, is this the thought of, like what you're saying now, that, they're, that they made it a crime uh, to speak out uh, from a mental standpoint, uh, to speak against one group or the other. But what I find interesting, though, is how that the United Nations is in concert with whatever the Vatican is speaking. And I've said so many times in the past that the United Nations only carries out whatever the Vatican has to say. But what you now a lot of times when I say these things, it's, it's just me saying it because I'm watching and observing as I see things happen what it appears to be to me. But when you when, when we have you on, Brother Gary, it's like connecting the historical dots that let us know that the United Nations is carrying out exactly what Vatican is decreeing it should be so. Well, what's really interesting about the United Nations also <clears throat> is that its principal design was carried out by one of President Roosevelt's uh, key advisors. And the, the symbol for the United Nations, if you take away the sickle of communist Soviet Russia, is the symbol for the United Nations, absent the sickle. In other words, to put it another way, the United Nations was framed, for most people that don't know, the United Nations was the successor to the League of Nations, which back in 1920-22, uh, there are, we talked about in some of our videos on the treaties, the land that was originally awarded to the reconstitution of the state of Israel post-World War I. And that was a very weak organization, and the League of Eight Nations gave way to post-World War II, the United Nations. Right. And so it's not surprising that the United Nations makeup has a very similar outline to a, a socialistic model uh, and therefore in concert with the goals. And, and what is one of the primary planks of socialism and communism? 
It's one shared by the Vatican, and that is redistribution of wealth. And we'll talk more about that. Redistribution and the controlling of wealth. Um, kind, of like Jana, kind of like Jana pointed out as well that I thought was kind of interesting is, is as she said, it's, it's definitely redistribution of wealth, but not the Vatican's wealth, only the people's wealth. <laughs> so, oh gosh, go ahead, Brad. <laughs> I just I couldn't help but to remember. No, that's okay. There. And so, remember that uh, that tr the UN was pushing that treaty back in the late fifties. The United States resisted it until November eleventh, nineteen eighty-eight, when President Reagan signed it, and then the U.S. Senate confirmed it on December ninth, nineteen eighty-eight. Now, if the Senate didn't confirm it, then the treaty wouldn't be valid. But if the Senate did nothing, that would automatically become valid. Some people have asked, that sounds uncharacteristic of Ronald Reagan, that he would agree to sign something like that. And my, my own personal thought to that is, did he really appreciate what he was signing? I mean, yeah, he should, and he was President of the United States. That's another question um, for another topic. Well, I tell you, what, tell you what, before we leave that, though, Brother Gary, one thing that when you bring up Ronald Reagan... I remember back years ago, and I used to have all the, the articles from Time Life magazine when they published an, an, uh, an article saying the Holy Alliance. And I believe it was Time Life magazine. It could have been a different one, but I actually had all the copies in a, in a little book. And this is where Ronald Reagan, along with uh, Pope John Paul II, had felt that they were called to work together. And both men had had an attempted assassination on, on, on them both. And so they felt very connected one, one with another. Um, at, at the same token, besides this holy alliance that they forged together to be able to topple uh, the Soviet Union, and not com the communistic regime itself, Russia, but to try to break up the Soviet Union because Pope John Paul II really wanted to see that Poland was free from the grip of Russia uh, because that was his home country. Uh, but ironically, also, the same time that um, uh, Alberto Rivera, who was a former Jesuit of the Vatican, had stated that they were taught that when a president of the United States did the, his inauguration facing an obelisk, that that's when it would be a sign to the Catholic world that they had conquered the United States, because it was one of their greatest objectives was to conquer this country here. And Ronald Reagan was the very president that actually faced the obelisk, which was the Washington Monument in Washington, D.C. They totally changed the way the inauguration had been done all the times previous to this. And he faced the Washington Monument and gave his inauguration doing that. And it's also kind of interesting because, because so many people have always looked up to Ronald Reagan and so many of the presidents that run now point back to him. That's, that's where they want to be. Uh, revered as they're like Ronald Reagan. Uh, they don't go back to George Washington any longer or Abraham Lincoln or some of the great presidents mm -hmm. we've had in our past. They go back to Reagan. That's an interesting point. Um, it's going to raise another issue when we, when we talk about how Pope John Paul II interacted with Gorbachev. Um, and we'll talk about the facts on that and then we can go back and actually uh, surmise what was going on. Uh, before we, we leave this point on genocide, the of interest as a follow-up in 2009, remember the genocide, the genocide treaty was confirmed in November of 1988. In 2009, the U.S. passed the hate crimes bill. So on top of the genocide treaty, which could be interpreted, uh, depending on how someone interpreted that, regarding mental anguish. The hate crimes bill, there's one protected minority group specifically listed in the hate crimes bill. What group do you think that might be? It's the homosexual, lesbian, gay agenda. And you know, and you know the, the odd thing about that, Brother Gary, you would think it would be like the, the black race or, or something, something along that lines. But, you know, 
You can't help but think, though, when they are protecting such, in, in the case here, the homosexual community here. Just like recently I did a video, and I really got after the leaders of Israel over the same issue. I said, you know, we're, we're looking at the Word of God, and God commanded Jeremiah the prophet. He said that you're, you're not honoring the Sabbath. You're allowing the, the, the Gentiles, the other nations, to bring in their burdens on the Sabbath day. And at the same token, I also got after the, the leaders of Israel. I said, you know, we're expecting the Mashiach to come to protect us. And yet, one, we let all the nations determine what we can and can't do in Israel. And here we are. We are having the, the prime minister and the president say publicly before the people that uh, you can be gay. You're welcome here in Israel if you're gay. The very things that we know that God burned Sodom and Gomorrah for and we're upholding these principles. And yet here the Vatican starts a he starts this article with the United Nations to be able to make this hate crime and they're they're condoning it. Right. And you know, again, I always try and draw the line because the gay and lesbian agenda or any group that has an agenda will always try and tie people into the issue. And, and I try and separate them, say, saying, look, you, you hate the sin, but love the sinner. In other words, we love the people. It's the behavior we t we're talking about. It's the behavior we're talking about, not legitimizing or legislating it in accordance with God's word. So just because we object to a behavior does not mean that we're objecting or uh, wishing in any way to harm an individual. And you know the other thing, too. Um, we're talking about at the highest levels of where decisions are made in this religious system. So for the parishioner at the local parish, the priest at the local parish that honestly have a heart for God and are trying to do the right things, this is probably the first time they're hearing of these things. And, and they're understandably, you know, asking questions. And so this is not directed at these individuals in terms of their responsibility for these things. These things have been in play a long time, and they're, they're just coming to light. Uh, in uh, 1961, let me go back here first before we go there to a term called interfaithism. Now, interfaithism, if we begin to agree only on core issues by disregarding our basic biblical doctrines that are steeped in the Bible so that we, we get to that point where we, we... And that's not to say that we, even if we disagree, we can't... Uh, have an amicable relationship, but we're talking about signing on to someone else's beliefs at the expense of by compromising our own biblical doctrines. That we should never do. That is a term, um, uh, uh, a result of that is what we call interfaithism, and that's where they want to go, and that's where they have gone by promoting, you're going to hear this term more and more, interfaithism. It's a term that means we're now inclusive not exclusive and you will what's an example in the Christian world when Christ said I am the way the truth and the life no one comes but to me no more, no one comes but to the Father but through me we know what that means that means that Christ died on the cross shed his blood because without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness of sins and if we believe on that, we're justified by faith in our forgiveness. Now, those who are inclusive would say, you can't say that because now you're exclusive. You're saying there's only one way to God through salvation from the Christian standpoint. Well, yes, otherwise Christ wouldn't have had to have died on the cross. Well, you're exclusive. You're practicing genocide. That's, that's mental anguish to tell someone that that's the only way that they have salvation. You see where this is going? Exactly. And so, in order to get to a place where you're accepted in interfaithism, whether you're Buddhist or Hindu or Wiccan, and I'm not making these things up because they've already had these, we'll get into that later, the various meetings that they've had, the organizational charters that have been signed. So keep that in mind, interfaithism. Well, when did we begin to see that? 
Back in 1893, the first parliament of world religions was held in Chicago. The goal was to pursue harmony among the world's religions and foster their engagement with the world and its institutions. They aim for a just, peaceful, and sustainable world. Now, well, who could argue with peace and a sustainable world on the surface? Remember, this is all world religions. This is not just denominations in the Christian faith or Judaism or etc. So 1893, we see uh, that interfaithism, uh, first parliament of the world's religions. Post-World War II, it was Prime Minister Winston Churchill, shortly after World War II, that called for a U.S. of Europe. Now, some people may not know that in addition to the United States, the strong presence of uh, the West here in the United States uh, in terms of political power, we had Russia. And so Europe now wanted to be on an equal playing field. And so Winston Churchill advanced the idea of a US, U.S. of Europe for political and economic, a political and economic power base that could compete with the U.S. and Russia by creating a union or a confederation of countries of European nations. So in 1957, the Treaty of Rome created a term that some people may have heard of, the common market, which would later become the European common market, which would later become the European Union. And that was initially created by six signatory nations and of course has followed by other nations. That was 1957, the Treaty of Rome. Very interesting, the Treaty of Rome. In 1959, of course, we talked about Pope Pius from the, the prominent religious viewpoint at that point uh, from the Vatican. And he talked about, again, removing any uh, nationalistic uh, narrowness. Now we jump to 1961. And there's a gentleman by the name of Augustino Casseroli. And he's appointed by now uh, Pope John the 23rd is in the Vatican. And Mr. Augustino Casseroli is appointed to build bridges and foster relationships with the Soviet Union, primarily with the Soviet Communist bloc. Because... The Catholic Church, the Vatican, favors the social economic, the socialist, uh, uh, socialist communist economic model. And so he's appointed to begin to build bridges with uh, the Soviets. In 1962, Pope John XXIII births that term ecumenicalism that we just talked about, which is promoting the unity among uh, not just the Christian denominations, but also primarily uh, we'll see that they're going to look at Islam as well, finding a common core for a joint association with Islam. And today the term some may have heard is Chrislam. Now, <clears throat> Brother Gary, that brings uh, a question in my own mind. Uh, we know, as you said, Chrislam is the very uh, fundamental core religion that they're using to unite these particular three religions. But what's kind of ironic to me is what brought the idea of bringing the Muslim religion in? Now, I know that they all say that we share the same common background. We all share the same. We have the father of Abraham. And, and, and really, that kind of brings me to a thought recently that I was thinking about. And this is really kind of ironic if you think, if you think about it. Now, according to the Muslim believers, they say that Abraham was not going to offer Isaac. He was going to offer Ishmael. And it was not Isaac. And so Ishmael was the promised son. But here's what's really kind of, that really just totally defeats their own doctrinal belief. 
They also say in the Quran, and I quoted in the book Yom Suf that I wrote, um, they claim that Moses was indeed the deliverer of the children of Israel when they were in bondage down in Egypt, that he called them out, that they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, and that when they get to the, the, the border and God does not allow them to go in, their take on this is that God tells Moses, not that he dies there, but these are a stiff-necked people. I'm, I've got two, uh, two uh, Arabic young men down in Israel, and you're going to go down there and you're going to start a nation with them. Now, the ironicness, or the, the, I don't know what you would call it, but what's interesting, though, if they believe that Ishmael was actually the son that, that Abraham was going to offer, but then does not, the angel stays his hand, how in the world then does Moses come along to deliver the children of Israel then? It doesn't make sense. Then who was the promised son? Well, two things come to mind. Uh, I'll go to the last point because it, it, the Bible says, ultimately, um, we know that ethnic group against ethnic group, there's going to be problems. Uh, we see even now within the Islamic, uh, the various sects of the Islamic faith, or, or we see different groups that are fighting against each other. The one world religion as it relates to the one world political system will be primarily, it appears the, it'll be from the Catholic Protestant arena uh, in, in, where the false prophet will be promoting the Antichrist. We know, we know biblically and prophetically that Islam, you know, we, we know about Ezekiel chapter 37, 38, you know, regarding the wars and those types of things. In answer to your question, why is it creeping up now here to envelop all the world's religions. Remember, we're not just talking about Islam. We're talking about the Hindus, the Buddhists. You're going to see a move because in their thinking along the way, if they can garner support and break down any objections across the entire playing field of all the world's religions to fall in line and promote the one world political agenda, that's what they're trying to do. And so they're going to try and do that with Islam, just like the other religions. We know that there's problems in doing that, that there will be problems in doing that. Well, that brings up one other question I'd like to ask you in your studies thus far. I look at the fact that Revelation says that she is the mother of harlots and of all abominations of the earth. So my question is, is what about the Hindu religion? What about the Buddhist religion? Is she actually the mother of these religions as well?